Alex. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. It's so good to all have you all here. Uh, we got a good show coming up for you. We've got a special guest coming in all the way up from Northern California. And so we got a couple of things to do. The first thing I want to do is to take a look for a moment at the calendar. And in order to do that, i um, got to share my screen here. So if you go to our website, theastroimagingchannel.org, you'll find lots of cool things to do. As you know, TAIC shots officially is over as of what today but you guys can still sneak in some pictures if you've got some good pictures of the um uh, solar system and you should get some good ideas tonight from drew because he's going to be talking about that you can still sneak them in because i think arno is still looking for shots so please go over to tac shots we're doing shots of the of the uh, solar system this this time around so get them in if you can but uh, I really wanted to go to the calendar for right now because um, the calendar is important to us. As you know, Drew is going to be here today and next week. He's going to be doing a two-part show because he's got so much stuff to tell us. <laughs> he couldn't fit it all in one place. So he's got he's got two days. Uh, and then Yuxio is going to be in here. And then uh, our team is going to be doing some tutorials and stuff like that. And, you know, the usual cool stuff. But on May 22nd, the weekend before Memorial Day weekend here in the United States. We're going to have a day off. We're going to have a day off because we can't be here. Most of us are, well, many of us as we can, we're going to be going to the greatest astro imaging conference on Earth, the, the Advanced Imaging Conference. Now, just to make sure you guys understand why we think it's so important that we go to that thing, I am going to let you talk to, I'm going to let you listen to Ken Crawford. Ken, you out there? Yes, I am. Stop sharing my screen so that you can go yeah. ahead and start sharing yours. And uh, tell us what you got to tell us. All right. Well, is uh, that working out? Can you see that? Uh, it says I'm sharing. Who's monitoring it? Okay. I'm not getting you. I'm not getting you sharing on your YouTube or on. No, I'll, I'll send sharing. again. I'll yeah. send again. Boom, share. And Here we go. go. That looks wow. good. All right. Okay. Hey, thanks, Alex, for having me. Uh, having me join you guys. It, I just think it's so important the work that you all do to keep uh, pressing ahead and bringing um, astronomy to the world in the way that you do, and that's just that's phenomenal. Uh, since 2004, I've been, I was one of the uh, founding sponsor, found, found, founders of the Advanced Imaging Conference. And since then, it's grown to be the largest gathering of amateur astrophotographers in the world. And we're proud of that. And the reason I, I wanted to come here, I wanted to make sure everyone realized what was going on. We normally have this conference in October. But because of the COVID restrictions and that type of thing, we flipped a coin and rolled the dice and we did hope that um, we put it off as far as we could. Unfortunately, that weekend sometimes is pretty tough for some people, but we really would love to see it. And now that the restrictions have been lifted, we can have a much more comfortable uh, conference. Uh, we'll be able to actually have people enter the uh, exhibit hall <laughs> and uh, we're excited about that. We have a really good lineup this year uh, 27 different presentations and workshops. You know, AIC's always wanted to be a great conduit for not only the amateur imager. Um, I know the name itself, Advanced Imaging Conference. We like to call it AIC because we do have a lot of um, start. You know, people who are starting out that show up. We have some good presentations for people who want to get started in astrophotography, and we have some specialized. Um, uh, workshops for that. We also are excited about um, having a keynote speaker, Dr. Phil Platt. I mean, he reason we normally bring someone like this to AIC is for inspiration. Um, it's, it's very nice to uh, be inspired from people who that's their job is know all about the, the items and things that we shoot out there in this guy. And, uh, we're excited to have him because he does uh, he does look at amateur shots and does use them in, in some of his presentations. So we're we're excited about that. Um, 
if if another thing that's important is i know some of you will not be able to make it we we would love to have everyone there but we decided the board decided um several years ago that we open up our digital library and that's on our website at uh, advancedimagingconference.com and the digital library allows you to uh, we do ask for one thing we ask for your name and your email address because we do put you in our um, little uh, uh, no, new, newsworthy uh, that we send out but we only do that around the conference time and you can always opt out but it allows you to go and actually see the presentations this year we're going to do a really good job with um, the recording and we're spending a lot of money unfortunately um a lot of the costs have gone up a lot since uh, we we started this uh, but we've tried to keep the costs down we have 32 exhibitors that's helping with that um, our exhibitors as you can see um, are some of the best uh producers of the products that in software that you use or would like to use and one of the great things about aic is being able to actually uh, touch feel and meet some of these people and the equipment that uh, that you'd like to procure or know more about. So um, this is our, our main entrance and our layout that we have that we have our 32 um, exhibitors there. And as you can see, it's a great list of people. And they spend a lot of money to do that. And I can tell you what was interesting. We didn't know what kind of reception we'd have um, since it, since we had to put this off. And it's been a few years since 2019 was our last um, we, uh, our conference. And we had, frankly, one of the biggest conferences we ever had. And we knew there was pent up demand for, uh, for our exhibitors wanting to have real face time with, uh, with their customers out there and the, the space sold out very quickly so uh you know that's 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 a very encouraging thing um our agenda um of course you can go see this on our, our on our website but as you can see what we've done is we've laid this out um with different themes you have equipment um, image acquisition and of course the fire hose of different uh, not only imaging methods, but uh, the, the image processing, which seems to be the biggest uh, biggest draw. We always get information and feedback back from our attendees, and that's always the biggest thing is is the uh, you know how to make those pictures pretty. So we have uh, quite an agenda there. And if you have any questions, would love to uh, to hear from you. Um, if if you need anything, um, as far as we we've done a great job about getting good 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 costs on our hotel, it's only $159. I'm not I'm not trying to sell anything, Alex, but um, we worked real hard about getting uh, really reduced rates. And this is the San Jose Convention Center, so that's uh, it's normally like a $300 rate. I can tell you that. Um, I don't know going forward uh, what the board is because the costs are going up so much in um, in San Jose that we may be looking for a different home, um, possibly outside uh, the state uh, in the future. We'll see what that brings. But uh, that's basically what I wanted to tell you is that you're all invited. We we hope that uh, if you can make the way up there, it'll be worth your time. Thank you very much. Question? Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, we did have a couple of comments as we were going along. Like I said, it was a, it's a, it's the best imaging conference, and then somebody else said it's the best one in the solar system, and then somebody else said it's the best one in the universe. And I don't know how far they've gone on that because I I thought it was getting silly. So I uh, anyway, uh, yeah. it is there. It is a very good thing, and you know I gotta also respect the people at Neath who. Um, yes. We're, we were going to miss next week also, but the people at NEEF, uh, they ran into conditions where they couldn't continue. And uh, so we are, so we. Um, That's very sad. They, they That's... Had, it is sad. It, it yeah. is tough to do these things. It's very tough it to, 
put on these conferences. Um, now, it's a little hard to read your, um, yeah, right there where you're pointing to your, um, your website. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it, it's advancedimagingconference.com. It's in San Jose, California. Now it's yep. obvious, okay? And yep. I've been going there for a long time. One other thing that you touched upon that I think needs reemphasis uh, is that it's advanced imaging conference, and it helps you advance in your imaging, but you don't have to be an advanced imager to go. And right. I know you touched on it, but it needs to be said again. Everybody understands that uh, there's a lot of there's some stuff for beginners there, and there's some and just walking around you learn a whole lot of stuff. Okay, yeah. um, no, I, I appreciate that. Another thing that's we find very interesting is because of great channels like yours, and there's lots of um, influencers, um, great content out there. Uh, how's that going to affect? face-to-face -face conferences. So it's, it is it is an interesting thing. I, I, I'm i sad to hear about Neef. I presented there in the past and um, awesome, awesome group of people put that together. And I, I really hate, hate to see that. So. Okay. Um, Molly, I think it is, has put in um, the link to your website in the chat right. area over there. Also, we do have a question. If if there's going to be a gear for sale board, um, it, it, well, I'll let Ken answer that, but it's definitely, well, in the yeah, past, so, there's never been a swap meet, but what else? Well, no, they. I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we have probably one of the bigger swap meets ever. I mean, we have people that have given us ten thousand dollar mounts i mean um it, it's amazing so that part is great but um yes the, the 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 people there who are presenting and who are exhibiting they do um they do commerce there so that is is possible um we 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 encourage them to give like an aic discount but one thing we are sad about is that um, Software Bisc, who is one of our founding sponsors, um, will not be there. And the reason is, is because of the supply chain issues that they're having. They're having trouble um, actually getting stuff shipped and that type of thing. So they pulled out of all conferences for the year. So, um, you know, it, it can be it can be tough on some of these suppliers. So we really appreciate when you do come that you do spend some time and, and, and say hello to these people because they spend a lot of money to, to get there mm -hmm. and to do that face to face. Um, and the way Don, Paul, Elizabeth asked the question, I think they're, um, they're asking, is there going to be a swap meet there? And there never has been a swap. No, meet well, no, not a, yeah. no, not, not used equipment or anything like that. You know, we, when we started AIC, we, we didn't want it to be a vendor show, but we wanted the vendors to be there and support us because that's part of it, right? We wanted it to be an imaging conference, number one. So um, everything that's there is, there, there's not a true swap meet in that sense of the word. Okay. And uh, one of, uh, Wanda's going to be there. Wanda's one of us. She's not, she doesn't make it to all the meetings here, but she's going to be doing some presentations there. So I want to give a shout out to Wanda. Uh, let's see. Astro Molly tells us that she bought her uh, uh, Mighty there. I remember when she did that. Boy, was she excited. And there's a suggestion that you try, you know, look into Stellophane and a few other places. Anyway, um, hey. thanks everybody for your comments. Thanks, Ken, for being here. Uh, I'm looking forward to being up there. I'm I'm driving up the coast in my RV to get there, and we're going to have a good time. Yeah, you you and Warren, right? Yeah, Warren, Chris, and I. Are, we every time he's got a conference someplace that I'm going to, we meet somehow and we drive around for a while. I think, the, think that's the outstanding. Place. And thanks again for uh, taking some of your precious time and letting me say hello. Okay. Uh, thank you. And that ends that first part of the show, our information about the uh, Astro Imaging Conference here and um, uh, or the Advanced Imaging Conference. Oh, and by the way, I apologize. Nowhere did it ever or did we ever intend to be called uh, to get confused with you guys, TAIC and AIC. Uh, and, I, and every once in a while, about every three or four months, I make it a point to tell everybody we're different 
organizations. We, you know, we are just completely different people. And it just so happens that our initials came out somewhat similar. That, that's okay. That's no yeah. problem. <laughs> okay. Thanks so um, much. And now, for those of you who would like to take some pictures of pretty solar system objects, We've got Drew Henry coming to us from Dallas, Texas. Drew, you want to start sharing your screen and take over from there? Drew, you're muted. Yeah, I'm, I muted you, Drew. Sorry. <laughs> you had some background noise in uh, in Google Meet. We've had a we've had a pretty adventurous time today with our technology. I'm still not hearing Drew. Hey, Drew, you need to hit the unmute button in Google Meet. Down at the bottom of the Google Meet page. There we go. Yeah, that one. There we go. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's showtime, dude. All right, everybody. Hey everybody, my name is Drew, and, uh-oh, hold on, there we go, um, and welcome to the show. This evening I'll be presenting an entry-level presentation on planetary imaging with the Dobson Telescope. Where this evening I'll be going over my gear and how I set it up, and the programs and setting, settings I use uh, while capturing my data that I use for my images. Next week's show I'll be... Um, talking about how I process those images. From start to finish, I'll be doing an image of Jupiter and show you all how I do that. And then, let's see here. Ba -ba -ba -bam. Anyway, a little bit about myself. I've been an amateur astronomer, astrophotographer for about three years now. I started off with a homemade Dobson telescope. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. It's a six inch Dobson telescope. I bought it off Facebook and I was snapping a few images with my smartphone built against the eyepiece to show my wife what I was able to see. And unknowingly at the time, it was a journey of being an astrophotographer. And there's a few of my images I got with that little bitty homemade um, six inch telescope. And a little bit about smartphone imaging. That's how I first got started, uh, image in the night sky. I still do it today, which is a pretty common way for folks who's getting started in astrophotography. Due to they already have an iPhone or a smartphone in their back pocket and they have a telescope, all you really need is something to attach your telescope or your, I'm sorry, your um, phone to your telescope. And all you got to do is uh, get your little mount there. And what I went for is that Celestron Next YZ which is a fairly popular choice. I purchased it off of Amazon for around 50 bucks. After attaching it to my Dobson, all I did was use the drift method while capturing my data. And I'll explain the drift method here in a little bit. Here are a few photos I got with my um, smartphone. Now, Dobsons aren't made for astrophotography. They're designed for visual astronomy, but they're capable of producing incredible images of the moon and our planets in our solar system. When imaging with the Dobson telescope, mirror size, also known as aperture, or the quality of the mirror when it's fabricated is its most important feature. The bigger the aperture, the bigger the object will be in your images, and the, and the better the quality of your mirror, the more detail you'll be able to pull out of the night sky. And take, for instance, the best mirrors available today are fabricated by the legendary Mr. Carl Zambodo. And Mr. Zambodo says there's a brightness which is provided by aperture and their contrast, which allows one to see detail. And that is a uh, mirror he made for Mr. John Dobson, who uh, fabricated the um, Dobson telescopes and created them. Now, you wouldn't think a two inch increase in aperture size would make much difference, but a 10 inch Dobson telescope pulls in 56% more light than what an eight inch telescope is capable of. And gathering light is a Dobson's primary job. 
that's why you'll hear a lot of folks call t the Dobson telescope a light bucket. Now, David Carlish, he's one of the best I've ever come across with a Dobson, uh, imaging with a Dobson telescope. He's one of my Facebook friends. I came acquainted with him on one of my uh, Facebook um, groups. Here's a few of his um, images that he caught with a 16-inch Dobson. He, nicknamed, he uh, comically nicknamed it Big Bertha. <laughs> the telescope we'll be talking about this evening is my 10-inch Dobson. I think, in my opinion, takes some pretty decent images as well. The first thing I do when things are looking promising outside, I pull out my smartphone and I check the weather conditions on my weather apps. There's a ton of apps out there that'll help you with this, but here's a couple of my, my favorites. The first one is going to be atmospheric. It's a free smartphone weather app that was purposely designed for amateur astronomers. You can find it on Google Play, and they also have a website if you'd rather look them up on a laptop. Atmospheric has a ton of information, and their forecasts are pretty, uh, pretty accurate as well. Sorry about that. Mm. Where did we leave off at? Mm. 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 And the next one's going to be atmospheric. I'm sorry, clear outside app. That's been around for a while, but it's still worth having. It's a really good app. Sometimes they'll contradict themselves, but after a while, you get used to them, and you'll know what time it is, or you'll know when a good time is to go out. Now, the first thing I wanted to like for you to concentrate on are two things. is the scene conditions and the upper atmospheric conditions. One of the most key important things I want you to leave here with today is without either one of these two being in good conditions, you're not going to be able to capture a good, good image, uh, good quality image. And the next thing I do is I pull out my smartphone and check out Stellarium. Now, Stellarium has a plethora of information about the night sky. I start off with looking at the planets that I want to image and the times that they're going to be high enough in the sky where I'm capable of capturing a good image. How we measure that height is, it, is measured in degrees above horizon. The importance of the planet's height in the sky is just as important as your weather and atmospheric conditions that we we're talking about. The lower the object is in the night sky, the more atmospheric atmospheric disturbance you'll have to deal with, but the higher it is, the less disturbance you'll have to encounter. I've heard of different heights to use, starting with 20 degrees to 40 degrees, but the bottom line is, the higher it is, the better it is, and I recommend not trying to image anything at under 20 degrees. If you're wanting a rough, enemy, or if you're wanting a rough measurement of how to measure the night sky, there's a couple of hand positions there I made up for you star hopping or trying to figure out where the objects are. Also, there's also a great tool to consider getting along the way, which is an atmospheric dispersion corrector or ADC for short. They help with the disturbance issues that we've been talking about. And they'll also help pull in more detail out of the objects that you're imaging as well. It has two prisms on it that you can adjust, but you gotta adjust them the same on each side that uh, takes care of the atmospheric problems. And then um, right here on, on this uh, right side here is on the fire capture, it has a um, thing that will help you uh, adjust it. Another thing I do in Stellarium is I do a quick zoom, on, zoom in on Jupiter and follow it while I do a fast forward on the path in the night sky. That way I can see if the great red spot, or GRS for short, is visible. And if there's any planets or any of the planet shadows transcending across Jupiter, that way I know what times are for when the good good stuff happens to Jupiter. So I'm gonna get my imaging times down so that way I can aim it there and um, point to it. And the only thing I do with Saturn is uh, check out what time it is, high, the higher it is in the sky. And that's when I um, try to image Saturn's when it's the highest in the sky. My third step is I grab my gear and I go to the field next door to where I live and I start setting up my gear. Since we're talking about my imaging locations, I'd like to talk about them for a second. Oops, one too many. 
There we go. Which is, whoops. Sorry about that, folks. Which is, planetary imaging doesn't have to have dark skies or dark sky location while imaging them. Unlike deep sky object, nebulas and galaxies are very faint in the night sky and require dark, dark skies and long exposure times to capture them. But planets in our solar system are the brightest objects in the sky that require very fast frame rates to capture them. The three top brightest objects in the night sky is going to be the moon, Jupiter, and Venus. I live in Irving, Texas, which has a portal class nine skies. Every, every image I've ever taken, we're in these class nine skies. So don't ever worry about how dark the skies are or how light the skies are when you're in the gym. Because right here is where I live, right here between Dallas and Fort Worth, a really bright place. In case you're wondering what uh, border class is, it's a measurement we use to categorize, categorize the, how dark the night sky is by nine different classes, one being the darkest and nine being the brightest, as you can see on this chart. Here's one of the United States also. Now, the first thing I do when I get to setting up is I take my OTA out of the um, bag there and I put a small fan behind my OTA where it's positioned directly behind my primary mirror. So my OTA can be in the process of reaching ambient temperature while I'm working on my platform. So it'll be ready for by the time I place it on the mount. Sometimes I wait a little bit more if it's a big difference in temperatures so it can reach the correct temperature. Um, the meaning of ambient temperature is basically bringing your Dobson OTA to the same temperature it is outside. And if you don't do that and you just try to hurry up and do it while well, different temperatures, it'll look like a hot Texas highway there in the middle of summertime with all the waves in it. Before I tell you about my EQ platform, I'd like to quickly discuss imaging planets with my Dobson before I started using a, a platform. I use what's called the drift method. A drift method is a way of capturing data for an image, for an image uh, that has no uh, driven mount. The Dobson tel telescope mounts are able to move manually up and down, side to side with great ease. Just capture multiple short videos in sequence while manually moving your Dobson mount or your OTA in front of the object while it drifts across your field of view. Again and again in a fast repetitive motion due to your capturing your data in a video format and having to take these planets rotation into consideration due to the planets rotation smearing the image over time, you have a limited time of capturing your data. So you have to move as fast and efficiently as possible uh, between the videos uh, so they'll run in a nonstop manner as possible. So when you uh, process them later. Back to the set of after setting the fan behind my OTA to cool down, I set up my EQ platform, also called, or also called the Equatorial Platform. Equatorial Platform is a specially designed platform that allows you to a non-driven Dobson to track astronomical objects in the night sky on an equatorial axis. About my platform, now my platform was custom made to my latitude of 32 degrees, fabricated by that legend himself, Ed Jones. Ed Jones makes his platforms from birch wood, and it's a two motor drive system, and the platform is solid as a rock, and it tracks like a dream. And if you ever ask me, it's a little underpriced for the quality and craftsmanship I got, and I highly recommend them. And there's his website in case you're wondering. Now, there's two things that uh, you have to do for the platform to work properly. One is make sure the make sure the bottom of the plat bottom plate of the uh, platform is on level ground and on stable ground. Two, make sure the platform is facing towards your true north. Without correctly doing either one of these two, your tracking would be poor. So I make sure I spend extra time on this step to make sure it's done properly. Now, if you're wondering what, um, what I was talking about true north is, instead of the uh, magnetic north, here is a wiki, wiki, uh, wikihow.com definition. And if you go a little bit further down than what the page is showing, it'll uh, give you a link that you can automatically um, calculate your, north, your time for your north location automatically. 
And as you can see from their calculator there, right there in the middle, that they're dead on. My true north is three degrees east of, which is 350 degrees, or 357 degrees instead of 360 degrees, which is my magnetic north. There's even a free compass app in Google Play that has both magnetic and true north feature on it. That's really nice app to have on your phone as well. Now that I got my true north settings, there's four things I need to accomplish leveling and putting my EQ platform in the correct position. It's a small level, a compass, some shims for leveling, and a stand I made out for my compass. Now compasses are really wacky acting when they get around any type of metal. So I put together this stand I made out of wood and just glue so I can set my compass on it. When it's put in the correct position, I can just look through that little bitty thing and uh, get my compass where it needs to, or get my platform where it needs. I look for a level area that's able to support the weight of my rig and put my bottom plate on it. And there I set up my compass so it to its needed position now, do you see the two black lines there on my bottom of my um, platform? And there's two lines on my compass. I line up those two lines to my bottom of my platform, and that's about as close as I can get to 357 degrees. Then I um, level it vertically and horizontally, and it's time to put on the top plate. See the top of or the uh, top of my EQ platform and the bottom of my Dobson mount. I drilled some holes in the top plate after measuring the bottom of my mount, so the bolt screws from my, the bottom of my mount can fit in there in the same exact level location every single time. Then I put my top plate on. Then I add my Dobson Asmus mount, and then I slap on my OTA on top of the, my OTA on top of that. Now, a little bit about my telescope. My telescope is a Dobson, a.k.a. Mr. White, an Orion uh, SkyQuest XT10, which has a 10-inch or 250-millimeter aperture and has a 1,200-millimeter uh, focal length. Bought him, off of, uh, bought him used off Facebook Marketplace, and he's pretty much my partner in crime while we're out there. And we make a pretty good team. Now, the next thing I do after I get them all put together there is I get out my um, laser collimator and collimate my Dobson. Now, collimating the Dobson is a very important step getting this uh, done correctly. The image, if you don't, if it's off just by a fraction, it can just ruin the whole image and you won't have a very good night at all. There's different types of collimators and how they function and also asking what I uh, uh, what suggest you do is you ask around to some seasoned Dobson users and watch a few videos before you get one because they have all different kinds of uh, styles and process and stuff. And then let's see here. I'll also uh, check my collimation during the night, especially if there's been a major temperature change or if I accidentally bumped into my uh, Dobson, which I do quite regularly. So um, I got the Hotec um, uh, laser collimator, and I just slide it, slide it into the eyepiece hole and tighten it up, make sure it's good and snug. Then with the screwdriver, I collimate the secondary mirror first, which is on top, by adjusting those three screws that are located on top of the spider that holds the secondary uh, mirror in place of my OTA. I get the laser pointed directly in the middle of the donut marker that is in the center of my primary mirror. After the secondary mirror is centered, I center my primary mirror. After loosening the three primary screws, I adjust the primary mirror on the bottom by adjusting the three screws until I get the laser dart to drop inside that hole in the middle. Then after it's adjusted where it needs to be, I just tighten up those screws and I'm all collimated and ready to go. I got the Telrad Finder. I love the Telrad Finder. I also suggest getting one of those risers on there because it helped me out tremendously from a bump of my head into my OTA. I got that riser and it solved that deal. But I screw my tailride finder in the OTA and adjust the tailride target with those three knobs you see right there until I get the uh, like the moon or something. I'll point it somewhere and I get the moon centered in my uh, tailride eyepiece and my the eyepiece I got sticking in my um my eyepiece 
<laughs> holder or whatever you call them. Uh, tell, uh, the object until it's centered in the eyepiece finder in the same time. Then I'll attach my Barlow and camera. I use a Teleview three times Barlow when imaging planets. Large focal lengths are needed due to the planets you're going to image are very small in the night sky. The definition of focal length is the distance between the center of the lens and the curved mirror and its focus point. So the longer the focal length, the larger the planet will be. Also, the weather conditions, I believe, will affect uh, how much focal length that you can use. You know, you go up to a four or five, but if your weather conditions aren't, you know, then you uh, aren't good enough for you to do that, you can't do it. Better the weather conditions, the more focal length you can use. There's a great website I use called Astronomy Tools. that can help you solving out issues with your gear that you're using. But my Dobson uh, 1200 millimeter focal length, if I use a three times Barlow, that's an increase my 1200 millimeter focal length times three, which will give me 36 millimeter, three, 3600 millimeters, and that's not too shabby. Weather conditions are rarely good enough to use anything better, better than that for my neck of the woods. And about my camera. The, ZDO, the ZWO ASI 224MC, it's a little powerhouse. It rose my imaging capabilities to a whole new level. And if you're planning on getting a dedicated planetary camera, I highly recommend them. The 224 has a small Sony IMX sensor with a pixel size of 3.75 microns to produce magnified, fast frame count and purposely made for planetary imaging. And the ZWO cameras require UV IR cut filter. It cuts off the unwanted wavelengths of the ultraviolet and infrared spectrum. I got this cheap one off of this cheap uh, sub Bonnie or whatever filter off of Amazon for less than like 20 bucks. It works fine. But without the filter, the image would be all be bad from the quality, letting the unwanted color wavelengths in. You gum up the image. Then I plug in everything to my power supply, which is this battery jumper air compressor that has a 110 watt socket on it that I got from Home Depot. Powers everything pretty good for the whole night. Then my laptop. The laptop you choose is a very important aspect of imaging. The faster, the better, the bigger the storage, the better due to the video files can be very large at times. So storage space is something you have to take into consideration when purchasing an uh, image lap, uh, imaging laptop. Also, your, your laptop's ability to capture and transfer the data in the fastest manner, uh, your laptop is something you need to consider as well. My, the laptop I use for imaging is a HP Pavilion, uh, 10th generation i7. I beefed up last season with a uh, 32 gig of memory and replaced my old SSD card with a more modern one, with a one, one terabyte card. It performs really well. So the next thing I do is I use the old Batonoff mask for focusing. I just slap it on top of my OTA, look for the brightest star I can find, when I get the star in my viewing window, I um, with my my uh, I use it with my, when I got my ZWO in there, and I'm looking through my uh, imaging software. Um, the mask would produce a angle diffraction spikes on the focal plane there of the instrument. I just adjust my focus to the center spike until it appears right there in the center of the two of the two other ones. So look, you have the three spikes. The, um, the same distance apart. Yeah, the optical, fo the optical focus is achieved when the middle spike is centered between the other two spikes, which you can see in this image. Then if needed, I, I tweak it after I land on a planet. It's really relatively pretty cheap too. And they're really nice to, for um, new imagers. I've used mine a lot. Something else before we move on, I'd like to mention a few uh, add-ons that I use come in handy for me, which is one, the first, the digital angle gauge 
has a magnetic bottom and I use it to help me find um, where to pump my Dobson in the correct position to find those hard to reach targets that you can't see, which helps uh, Stellarium because it has a uh, real time coordinates for my compass and uh, this, uh, digital uh, finder here. I can find, you know, planets like Uranus and stuff. That's how I found this. Is my first image of uh, Uranus I found with um, Stellarium, my compass, and my digital angle guide. Mm. Then I also got this rotor lock thing from um, William Optics. It's like um, it twists your, um, uh, it has a twist tight on it instead of just um, those thumb screws. That way it's got the same um, tightness all the way around it and the thumb screw is not pressing up against it and uh, pushing your uh, your bar low or whatever you're looking at into one, one, uh, one place that keeps it, everything in the middle. And that's pretty much about it on that one. And we're going to talk about the software I use on capturing data. Now, the planets, you got to take into consideration, like I was talking about earlier, their uh, rotation. And everybody, you know, there's different times people use. No, nothing's etched in stone. And here's a good one that go by, like Venus right here. There's no real time limit because, you know, it's got the clouds all the way around it and there's really no features. Mars, five minutes. Jupiter, uh, five minutes. I usually go about three minutes for myself on Jupiter. And Saturn, 10 minutes. Now, if you go, if you try to go any further on these uh, than what's shown here, it'll start uh, creating distortion in your picture because um, the rotation of the planet will mess you up. And a fast frame rate is a very important thing because you want to get as many uh, frames as you can. You want to get your, uh, as many frames you can in that uh, allotted time, which is, you know, two or three minutes, you know, which isn't that much. But these uh, planetary cameras, you know, you can get upwards of three, 300 to 350, uh, 350 a, a second. So you can get a pretty high frame count with them things. And the second thing you need to take in consideration is the video format. 99% uh, of the um, planet are caught in a video format. You have the AVIs and the SERs. It's just pretty much a personal preference, you know, after you research it or whatever, which one you want to use. I use that SER files. That's my favorite. The um, APIs have been around for about 30 years. And a lot of people catch some good images with that one. But um, this one just, I don't know, I just like it a whole lot better. And the software I like to use is Fire Capture. There's a couple of other ones out there, like um, Sharp Cap and stuff, but... I think sharp caps more uh, geared towards deep sky objects instead of planets. Fire capture is totally for planets, and I love it. And Torsten has a um, a YouTube page, and he has all kinds of tutorials that it goes over every single thing on there. He's very detailed on his um, YouTube, showing everything that he has on there, just like he is on his software. That's really good. Now, the first thing you're going to do after you uh, open it up for the first time is you're going to get this screen here that's going to show you the cameras. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You know, just pick your camera. And if you want to, first, there's a dummy camera option. You can go on there and fool with it and get acquainted with the software and then go for it after that. The first thing I do is I go under the settings and go underneath the settings, underneath the settings, and I click this Win Jupos. Uh, tab right there. So in case you want to use WinJupos, you'll have the information on the um, file to be able to use that program. And it's a very good program to use. And then let's, I'll go up there and I'll check the uh, histogram right there. And that way my histogram will be on the display. If not, it won't. And that is something how you measure your, um, how light your um, different wavelengths are, your RGB. The next thing I do, whoops, did it again. Next thing I do is I 
turn on the debayer pattern. And then I check this little box down there on the bottom. It um, stops the debayer from um, going while you're capturing your data. That way it's recorded um, in color while you're capturing your data, but your screen is in black and white. So it'll put more, uh, uh, put more emphasis on the capturing uh, data instead of what you're show what's shown on your screen. The next thing I'll do is I hit the max on the preview speed. That tells you how fast it's going to be previewed over there on your on your screen over there. You can go turn it down if you want to, but I like to um, put it on max to be able to see, you know, real time stuff. Then we'll go up to region of interest, which is very important because it has a lot to do with um, your frame rate and how fast you can um, uh, get your frames and how many frames you can get. Uh, right here is a, I do mine in 8-bit, but if you want to change it to 16-bit, you can, but I don't really see a reason for it because 8-bit's fine for um, for planetary imaging. I don't buy my uh, my um, my pixels or anything, so I just leave it at 1 times 1. Anyway, on top here, it's going to show your max um, uh, region of interest. And if you want to change it, you can hit this tab right here, and it'll have all the all the um, in, uh, region of interest that is uh, on your camera that you can use those. But the region of interest it has a lot to do with your frame count because if you have your object really small and uh, like a, a bunch of you know space around it, you're going to have very slow frame, uh, frame count. But if you get your frame count or you get your um, region of interest as tight as you can on, on that planet, it's going to um, speed your um, speed your uh, frame count up. So the smallest uh, ROI you can get is what I recommend so you can get a um, real fast frame count. Then, Okay, then, the next one. then we'll go down to the exposure gain, which is my two most used um, things that I use in here is my exposure gain. Um, now, the exposure, the higher your exposure is on your images, the less frames you're going to have. But the less exposure you put on there, the more your uh, frame count will be. And your gain there will help you out on that. The higher your gain, the lower your exposure can be. But the higher your gain is, you're going to have higher noise. Higher noise. But your gain, but the uh, frame count can take care of your noise if you can get a good frame count. So I try to get my exposure time down as much as possible. And then the next one down is the capturing tab there, and right then. We're, on top of it is you're going to be your file location. And if you want to go check out your file location, there's a little tab right here on the side of where uh, your imaging or your frame or your viewing window is right there that you can see um, your data capturing files. And then right here, oh, then right there is going to be, if you want to, the Jupiter, it says Jupiter right there. That's going to be like your, if you have a set, um, um, way of doing things or whatever you can um you can click that and it'll go to a, a specific set of settings that you have ready for jupiter and you have one for saturn a specific set of settings but i just keep it on there and full with uh, just one of them and then right here you get to uh, see ser files or avi files see i got um ser click there and then you can limit your times on your um your capturings uh, by right here, see, I got that set to 180 seconds, which is what I use for Jupiter's three minutes. And then right here is your pause button, which is really good for people using the drift method because you know you got to stop your uh, imaging to uh, move your OTA back in front of the um, object. That way, you can uh, just push pause instead of making a whole new file. And after you get it a position where you, it needs to be, you can, um, you know, press unpause and start recording again. The next one's going to be your status. All it is, it tells you about, you know, your RAM and your um, 
and your uh, the size of your uh, SSD card and tells you your uh, max frames and all that stuff. You can also um, uh, click right click on this while you're doing the capture or whatever, and if it's bogging down on you, it'll it'll uh, speed it up real fast. But here's little pictures I got. That's when I was uh, redoing my my laptop. And the histogram. Uh, histogram is a very very important part too. Um, because this is what controls the lightness of your image. What I like to do is my green on mine is in a, it's in a stationary. I can't do anything with it. So that's the one I use for my measuring. My blue channel is the weakest. So I get that as high as I can. I go over one. I go over here to this where this more, this more button is right there on your exposure gain. Um, tab and you go over here and um, right here see I got my brightness to 99% and right here's where I just my my red channel and like I was saying my green channel like I can't move I can't move it so that's the one I use to measure it with and I'll uh, either add or subtract my red channel to get even with with my green channel and then I'll use that when I get them all even that's when I uh, uh, Use my exposure gain to um, get get the uh, brightness where I want it. Now the brightness where I want it has a lot to, like I was saying the exposure time has a lot to do with your frame count. What I try to do is I you you hear a lot of people go you know brace it up there to 80, 90, whatever. I like to try to keep mine around 75 percent. That way you get a small uh, higher frame count and. When you're trying to process your images, it will. Um, if, you, if you if you have the histogram too high um, while you're doing your processing, you have no room to um, to um, adjust your um, your your because it your levels go up when you sharpen your image in um, Registax, and anything over that one percent point one percent in your um, weight of your uh, channel or your uh, different channels you're going to be losing data so you're going to want to keep that as close to one percent as possible and if you go to 80 85 percent and then you try sharpening and, you, and it starts moving it up you, you won't have any room to sharpen you'll be losing your data so then all i do is i press play and start capturing my images and that's about it for uh, my setup and my um, my uh, the way I captured my uh, software, my, my data in the software, and that's next week's right there. How I, this is my uh, a raw video and SER file, and then um, the other one is where I we're gonna process it to um, the finished product, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Let's see uh, how we doing on questions over there. Uh, we had a, a couple people making comments about that you're doing a really good job, particularly like the detail and things like that. Um, and let's see, I don't know if there are any other questions. Are there, Eric? Did you notice any as you were monitoring? Well, I have a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Well, I'm good in the room. How, I see for 180 seconds with that fast frame rate, how big are your files? Oh, I can get, um, you know, uh, like the one I'm going to be showing um, uh, next week, it's probably almost around 40,000 frames. And I mean, That's, I mean, you go anywhere from 300 to, you know, 375. You got to, you got to look, you got to look at your, um, you got to find out what your, your gain, your average gain setting is for your uh, camera. And for the uh, 224, I believe it's uh, like, 250 to 275 but i'll raise it my gain up to 300 to 350 and I, a lot of people go man that's crazy i mean it's really noisy but i mean if you get you know you know 35 40 000 frames you, you, that'll cancel that noise out and it'll make it a whole lot sharper so with jupiter and saturn how many pixels are you actually working with at uh, what 3600 millimeter focal length ah man you, you're talking greek to me there i really don't know I mean, I know it's um, your, your, your um, area of interest. Did you say is 640 by 480? Well, see, um, 
I had I had my uh, presentation ready to go, and I clicked over there to the Fire Capture website today, and I saw that he released a new version, and uh, the interface of the whole uh, Outlook on it is totally different than what it is on the old version. So I had to go in there real quick and uh, redo everything. But um, what was your question again? Well, how I big, just wonder. How big is your okay, there, we've got Eric's question is, how big is the planet? Oh, and they're, they're really small. Okay, how ahead. many pixels big is the planet? They're really small when you try. I mean, if you're looking at through them on an eyepiece or even through, you know, the camera, okay. it's really small. But when you well, get how in many, there. How many pixels does it cover? How many pixels is it across the face of Jupiter or across the face of Saturn? Uh, well, let's see here. Uh, I really don't know. I couldn't tell you that. Um, um, well, 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 you your, the, your uh, area of interest. In my, yeah, my, I'm sorry, sir. It down, so it's just slightly no, bigger than the planet? No, sir. What I do is I just use my re region of interest to... Um, I, th what I usually use for Saturn is 640 by 480, and I usually use um, 1280 to 720 for Jupiter, or I go to 800 to 600, 800 by 600, or sometimes then, 600 to 600 by 600. And then the follow-up of that is that if you've got on your computer screen a 480 by 640 uh, region of interest, how much, uh, how how much of that is oh. is taken by the planet? Oh yeah, uh, with Jupiter, I mean, so with Saturn, with six forty by four eighty, it, it it pretty much fills up the whole screen. Okay, it really does. So if you're doing the drift method or something, you know, you're gonna have to get that bigger, um, like twelve eighty by seven twenty, that allows you to capture your data while the you know it's drifting through your uh, field of view. That way, you got more time to um, you know image it. But if you got a, a platform, a I mean, I really recommend getting a platform. It's just as important as the Dagum uh, telescope itself. It just makes it so much easier, and it just it, you get you get to concentrate concentrate on other things other than just um, you know moving your OTA back and forth, back and forth. You can concentrate on other things to you know get other better images. So when you're watching the image on the screen on the preview, do you look for those moments or minutes where you have really good seeing or do you just wait till it's at the yeah. maximum altitude and right shoot? i just uh yeah that's pretty much my starting point right there is you know is i allow myself you know enough time in between you know where it's you know the highest above the horizon but you can tell while you're imaging when uh you'd be looking at your screen and all of a sudden it'll go from kind of okay to oh man that's gonna be a good image you know what i mean you get all excited going that's the one i'm gonna use. You, you, you know you're gonna use that one but it, it it changes through constantly through the night. I mean, but you can see you can see it on your uh, preview screen when it gets better. So you're sitting there with your your finger on the trigger, just watching for those moments. <laughs> no, I just I just you know I got a one terabyte you know um, SSD card. I'll just capture you know keep capturing, and then you know like maybe halfway through the night if I'm getting too close to my uh, the edge of where I need to be, I, I go in there and delete the. The worst ones that I know I'm not going to use, and I'll keep my better ones and keep going. How many megabytes is each file? Oh man, I got some some files that go up to twenty to thirty gig just for one video file. Yeah, those those video files get big in a hurry. They, they really do, and the bigger your uh, region of interest is, like twelve eighty or yeah, the twelve eighty by seven twenty. Yeah, the bigger that is, they they get really big. The so, six foot six forty by four eighty. That, that's a really good size to use for planets, if you can. So next, I want to ask you any processing questions because sure, you're go going ahead. to do that next. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a whole lot better because I'm not going to have to redo it at the last minute like I did the had to do today. Yeah, it's. it's I apologize annoying. about that. It, those updates can be annoying sometimes because right when you think you got it all ready to go, somebody comes along and changes everything. It's, <laughs> Okay. Try writing a book. Oh and, man! And, and wait, and you just every time they update something, you got to go. Oh, no, not again. Yes, so sir. lucky imaging is exactly that. You have to get lucky. So you lucky can't be imaging. putting your, your button off mask on and off and on and off. So you, do you try to make any focus adjustments? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, if, if I have temperature changes or like sometimes I bump into my OTA on on accident. 
you know, any any little slight anything can, uh, you know, affect How your do you focus? focus. I'll just How um, do- yes, sir. I'll just uh put um I'll put my bat knock mask on and swing it over to a bright star and do a quick adjustment with my um with my bat knock mask on and then I'll swing back over to the planet afterwards. And don't forget to take your bat knock mask off because I've done that before. And you're looking at your screen going, what happened? <laughs> you're like, oh, my bat knock mask is still on there. Okay. Oh, there's so many things that can be going wrong that we we ask the same question. What did I do? So, oh, yeah. So you actually go over to another star rather than trying to manually tweak the focus? I can't. You know, I got my eyesight isn't really all that good. But what I like to do is I'll, uh, after using a bat off mask on a star, and I swing it over, you know, I might try to, you know, tweak it a little bit each way and see if I can get any better. But I usually just kind of go with what the bat off mask is telling me. And I gotta, the big people like, oh, um, the, that fellow who uh, does Jupiter real good, I forgot what his name is. He's really uh, famous, but he says, you know, don't use a bat off mask. But I, unfortunately, that's what I use because of my scene. Okay. Now that probably that wouldn't be my first choice either. But if it works for you, you know it works. Yes, sir. And yeah. and Particularly focus the... is is something that's going in and out all the time. So. Oh yeah, definitely. Do you know what your region of focus is? Um, no, sir, I don't. What what size scope do you have there? I, oh yeah, I got the ten inch that has a, a two hundred and fifty fifty four millimeter uh, aperture on it, yeah. and twelve hundred millimeter focal length. Okay. So it's it's got some depth of uh, feel, just depth of focus. Um, but you know, a okay. uh, little oversampling isn't bad on planets, which is actually pretty nice. Oversampling is kind of recommended a little bit, but not too much. It, it, it's better for the planets. That's right. The uh, rules are, on lucky imaging are not the same as DSOs. Oh yeah. See, I just got it started in a deep sky object, and it's just total opposite of each other. I mean, totally on every, pretty much everything you can think of. And it's taken me a whole lot longer to learn it than I thought it would because I started uh, imaging with my Dobson thinking, oh, you know, I can go do deep sky now. But yeah, it's totally different. Molly points out that SharpCap has a cool feature called the seeing monitor. Molly, turn on your microphone and you explain it. Well, I didn't want to put it on people that's like, Oh, you use that tool? Well, I got a better tool, you know. I don't want to be like that. No, 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 not at all. Please. I'm <laughs> uh, so um, I'm a big fan of SharpCat, um, and uh, they have a tool called the Seeing Monitor, mm. where um, you can um, – it'll show it, – you, you put a little box, of, like a region of interest box over the um, – like the, like the edge of the planet or part of the planet and mm-hmm. it will gauge the the seeing and it'll gauge the, oh. the goodness of the clarity and then it has like a graph on the bottom and it'll show like where the mean is and then you set a oh. threshold and it will only record frames that are better goodness than that threshold so that oh. way you're not taking tons and tons of data um and and then throwing out the bad frames later um and it can see when the seeing is good in mm-hmm. much smaller periods of time than your eye can so it can, hmm. it can grab those little tiny moments of good seeing that are in in moments of like average seeing, and it, it'll it'll grab those out and just huh. save those to the file. And that's wow, that's thing. nice. So I use I use that fairly often when I'm doing planetary imaging. I might have to check that out myself. I can't um, remember offhand if it's in the free version or the pro version, but the pro mm-hmm. version is only like fifteen dollars a year. So oh, that's not it. bad. <laughs> yeah, Molly. Molly, while you're at it, uh, does it is it saving the individual frames in the video file? Yes. In a video file, it's not saving each separate it's file. It's however you've specified. So I usually save as a video file as an SER, and it's saving those frames in the SER file. Okay. Mm. So it's doing the first it's doing the first set of uh, frame rejection. Yes. Before it even records it. Right, and that helps save a lot save a lot of disk space. <laughs> okay. And then Terry wants to know about your equatorial platform. Tell us more about your, by the way, once you got an equatorial platform on it, you no longer have a cannon mount. And that's what Dobson called his mounts, was a cannon mount. Hmm. And so technically you're on a newt with a <laughs> Dobsonian platform on an equatorial platform. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's pretty much care. it. Man, they're, they're just so, it, it, it changes your imaging from night to day because yeah. you just, 
you're working constantly if you're trying to do the drift method, you know. But I mean, I love, I mean, I absolutely love imaging planets. And even though I got a deep sky object rig, I mean, planetary imaging is going to be, you know, my my main focus. But uh, with the with the EQ mount, they're totally worth, you know. Do you do your research because I bought one before that. I bought it because it was the cheapest one I could find, and it was just a hunk of junk. And then I did my research and found out who, you know, who made the best ones or where I could find me a good one for the best price, you know, instead of, you know, spending thousands of dollars and going overseas to where it cost me, you know, a big chunk to, you know, ship over here. You know, I found me, a, found me, Mr. Ed, Mr. Ed, Ed Jones makes some really good platforms, man. I highly recommend it. It took me about a year and a half to get it, though, because he only makes them, you know, during the summertime. And then the COVID thing hit and he no no materials he wasn't able to get his materials and uh but I, I sat there and i just toughed it out and waited man and it was really worth the wait really good platform yeah the only problem with planetary imaging sometimes is we don't have enough planets oh yeah definitely that's well the the, the, the seasons and the season's about to kick off really pretty quick which i believe jupiter or i'm sorry saturn reaches uh you know 20 degrees above horizon at the end of this month which will be the first one and you know this year, this season is going to be the season with Mars, and it's going to be a really good season because I think it, um, during its opposition, it's going to be up about uh, 87 degrees in December. It's not going to be as close as it was two years ago. It's just going to be a little bit further away, but that high position in the sky, I think it's going to be, um, we're going to get some really good uh, detailed images of Mars this year. Awesome. Uh, what is uh, I'm capturing. Ishan points out that he's capturing directly from his mirrorless camera. Hmm. Uh, now he's got a 305 millimeter go to oh. that he uses instead. There you go. Uh, how much better is a dedicated planetary camera versus a mirrorless? Did you try with the DSLR at one point or any other no, cameras? No, sir. Uh, I've seen some really good pictures taken with DSLRs and. I've heard, you know, I've seen planetary imagers say, you know, they, they say they just can't even touch them. Uh, the dedicated planetary uh, or the CMOS cameras, the dedicated planetary uh, cameras, but they, I've seen some really good, really good pictures uh, taken from DSLRs, but I, I can't personally speak on, you know, how they take it. Cause I've never, the only thing I've ever had is that a 224. But the, another good thing the DSLRs take, I think, is the lunar pictures. I've seen some really incredible uh, pictures of the moon with that. I really like um, imaging the moon as well. I like to try to, you know, get to where, the, you know, the, the Apollo missions landed and stuff like that. Okay. I think we've um, gotten all the questions in and some of the comments. Uh, is there anything else you need to say, or can we just get ready for next week? Yeah, man, I'm really uh, ready for next week. It's going to be a whole lot better presentation since I didn't have to redo it like I did today. But yeah, I'm all set and ready to go with it. I think okay, it's well, going to be pretty. It's going to be pretty nice. It's going to have a lot of detailed information in there for people. Okay, cool. And uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the uh, Astro Imaging Channel and everybody. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, thank Ken for being here a little earlier in the day mm -hmm. uh, when he told us about AIC. And remember, AIC and TAIC are different organizations. We are not AIC. We're TAIC. So just, just remember that. I know there's, there's, there's a sloppy um, offhand way we say things sometimes, but uh, they started and they, they got the AIC name first. So uh, out of respect for them, we got to do that. Uh, let's see, Molly's commenting. Yeah. Okay. So just answering. Some uh, questions. And the platform is great. Incidentally. Oh, so, yeah, thanks. I think that includes everything. I think it's time to say good night. Besides that, we'll be back with Drew. If you got some more questions for Drew, uh, bring them up and, and, uh, and we'll get a hold of them next week and we'll see ya. Gary. You're in charge tonight, right? So you can take us out, or is it is it Tim got in charge? Whoever's in charge. Him.